Governor Roy Cooper has ordered everyone in North Carolina to wear a face mask. Enforcement of that order creates both practical problems and legal concerns. That's the conclusion our next guest has reached. Jeanette Doran is president and general counsel of the North Carolina Institute for Constitutional Law. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. So this is pretty a widespread order from Governor Cooper. Everyone, with some exceptions, has to wear a face mask. Given your role as a constitutional lawyer, you looked at this and found problems of more than one type. Let's, first of all, before we get to the practical problems, you're not even talking about whether the governor has the authority to order people to wear face masks and uh, whether face masks themselves are worthy of, of wearing. You, you sort of set that to the side. We assumed for the sake of discussion that face masks are useful. Uh, I think a lot of people figure that these days, that there's been some some debate about that and government guidance has evolved. But we also assumed, just for the sake of argument, that the governor has the authority to issue a statewide mandate that everyone, with a few exceptions, has to wear a face mask. So we assumed that and focused really on the enforcement protocols in his executive order. So given those assumptions, which people could could argue with, but given those assumptions, let's start first with practical problems. What do you see as practical problems with this order? Uh, There are quite a few, actually. So um, there have been a number of reports across the country of violence toward really frontline workers when they've asked customers and patrons to wear a mask or uh, comply with social distancing requirements. So what the governor has done is he has, by forcing businesses to be the ones to enforce this face mask mandate, um, what he's done is he's required businesses to take on what is essentially a law enforcement role. And that is a problem because those are not workers who are trained in the sorts of de-escalation tactics that are part of basic law enforcement training. So what's going to happen if we have, you know, a a 16-year-old hostess at a restaurant ask a patron to put on his mask and he loses it? I mean, tensions are high. People are so incredibly stressed emotionally, financially. So this is the sort of uh, lightning rod that could create a huge physical altercation under these sorts of of circumstances. Um, And of course, violence is never the answer, but it happens. And the governor should anticipate that. This is totally foreseeable. Uh, Then if you're a business owner, you've got to ask yourself, you know, what's my liability? Am I going to get sued by an employee who gets assaulted? Am I going to get sued by a customer who perhaps is um, grieved by an overzealous employee. And then, of course, there are lots of privacy and discrimination laws that come into issue. And I think the governor, to his credit, tried to work around some of those legal issues. You alluded to this, but we should point out that the reason that these are the practical concerns is that although this is an order for everyone to wear a face mask, the order is not contingent on law enforcement stopping an individual and charging them. The businesses are the ones and other organizations are the ones who are mandated to carry this out. Yes. So if you read through the order, the order states businesses must require that their customers, or in the case of restaurants, patrons, wear a face mask. When you, when one scrolls down to, it's about page eight of the executive order. Which is bad news in and of itself. <laughs> it's at least eight pages. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, when you get down to the enforcement section, the governor specifically states in number one, and there are three there, in number one, he specifically states, only businesses and organizations will be cited. Number two, he specifically states law enforcement is not authorized to issue citations to individual workers, customers, or patrons for failing to wear a mask. Now, at number three, he states that law enforcement 
can cite people for trespassing if a business asks a customer to leave and they refuse to do so. But that's just a reflection of the current state of law on trespass. So he's put all of the responsibility for enforcing the mask requirement on businesses. We've talked about the practical concerns. Let's turn now to some of the legal issues. Uh, As a person who focuses on constitutional law, you looked into, okay, if the governor is going to give this order, what is the basis? How how can he go about doing this? We, We know that governors can't do anything they want to do. What did you find when you looked into the basis of the authority the governor has to issue this order? Well, it's interesting the way the order is structured. Um, he cites at various points in the beginning, actually for several pages at the beginning of his executive order, miscellaneous statutes. Um, most specifically, he seems to cite the Emergency Management Act, the the particular statute that gives him, quote, additional powers during a declared state of emergency. Unfortunately, When we get down to the portion of the executive order with the specific mandates, things like um, capacity limitations and face mask requirements, there is not what a lawyer would refer to as a pinpoint or specific site adjacent to the directive. So we don't know for each of those orders exactly which of the statutes the governor is is relying on for his statutory authority. And and from a layman's perspective... Why should they care? Well, the governor doesn't have the authority to just make up the law as he goes. Uh, And that surprises people because if you read these executive orders, they, they smell and read and look very much like legislation. But constitutionally, the governor doesn't get to legislate. Now, he does have authority to issue executive orders. Um, and during a state of emergency, We have statutes that give him extra authority, but we're not clear which of those statutes he's relying on, which makes it difficult to figure out whether he is exceeding the scope of what's called statutory authority. And there are some instances in which things that the governor might want to do, he can't do on his own. He needs to get input from the other elected statewide officials who we know is the Council of State. Correct. There is a portion... uh, of the additional powers statute, uh, it's the, the there are basically four parts, A, B, C, and D. So part B, which really gives him a great deal of authority, but it only gives him a great deal of authority if he seeks concurrence of the Council of State. He did not cite to that for the face mask requirement, and there's been no reporting that he even asked for their concurrence. Um, When we look back to March, he said he had concurrence for the restaurant closure. Um, That's been factually disputed by members of the Council of State, but he didn't even bother with that. With this one, he seems to be relying on other portions of that statute. Now, this obviously is of concern to a constitutional lawyer. Why should this be of concern to the average voter or average resident of North Carolina? I think we all, as as voters, as citizens, as, as people committed to our community and to our state, we need to hold government accountable. We need to put their feet to the fire and ask them to show us what authority they have because if we don't do it now, we're going to end up potentially in a dictatorial state. I don't think anybody wants to live under a dictatorship. People flee from dictatorships. And if we don't start asking the hard questions about constitutional and statutory authority now, when will we? Now is the time to ask. The Constitution matters most in a crisis. You've outlined the problems. What could happen either from the governor's office or legislatively or from the courts to help address and uh, solve some of these issues you've resolved or that you've uh, laid out? Well, in an ideal world, the governor would self-correct. He would dial back these orders. He would seek concurrence of the Council of State. Uh, He would write clear 
limited orders. He would respect individuals' rights to make their own choices. Uh, he would respect the rights of business owners. I hope that happens. I don't really foresee it happening. <clears throat> so then that leaves us two other options. Uh, there's a possibility of litigation. I think that's very likely. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the lieutenant governor has indicated his intent to challenge these orders. I think there's a chance we'll see that possibly from trade groups, possibly from individual businesses who want to know, uh, why are you hijacking my employees to be your enforcers? We've already seen... The face mask cops. Exactly. Um, and we've already seen litigation in other contexts. Uh, the, the courts, federal court ruled in favor of those religious organizations and churches that had challenged other orders. Um, the governor's been successful in defending some of his edicts in other lawsuits. But I think we're going to see more of that. The legislature has pushed through, um, sometimes with significant bipartisan support, various bills to reopen other establishments. Uh, we may see more of those whenever this continues, should this continue. Uh, they haven't done much more of that uh, lately. They're, they're, we've seen some bills in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the governor's vetoed. Will we see more of that if the General Assembly comes back? Quite possibly.